skills for the monarchy in Monaco. But her fairy tale marriage was cut tragically short. Grace Kelly has died. When she died, a light went out of Monte Carlo, which has never been lit again. Grace's death shocked the world, but it also left three grief stricken children, Caroline, Albert, and Stephanie, struggling to forge lives without a mother. They were thrown into this terrible state, and of course, if you are royal, the show goes on. For decades, the three children suffered misfortune in marriage as they grappled with Grace's death in different and dramatic ways. Stephanie rebelled against royal life, while Caroline was continually unlucky in love. Stephanie literally went off and joined the circus. She went totally to pieces. He was obviously the love of her life. And Albert gained the reputation of a playboy prince. Was he tempting fate? Was he taking a risk? Was he trying to destroy his future? I have no clue. Was it their mother's death, a curse, or just being spoiled rotten? For the rest of eternity, none of the Grimaldi family would have success or love or happiness in marriage. When you perceive that you know, your mother was the greatest gift to Monaco. It must be really difficult to work out your place in that story. Will I ever measure up? Can I ever be as good as her? Grace Kelly had three children, Caroline, Albert and Stephanie. Born into one of the wealthiest royal families on the planet, their assets are rumored to be worth over one billion dollars. Grace Kelly's three children were brought up in a vacuum. They were brought up in a bubble. Their life has been one of fabulous wealth and luxury, polo, lunches, champagne, and indulgence. Despite their lives of luxury, there were challenges for all three. The three children have all had their, uh, their ups and downs. They've all had their fair shares of marital difficulties and tragedy. Every family has its trials and tribulations. The huge difference between ordinary folk and the royal family is that there's this spotlight onto them and, and the press is always waiting to expose any of these things. The family suffers from what lots of rich, famous families do. I'd say they have more money than sense. But growing up in the house of Grimaldi might not be the fairy tale it seems. On the 23rd of January, 1957, Grace's first child, Caroline Louise Marguerite, was born. She had to always be the good girl, to observe protocol, to do the right thing, to say the right thing, all at the right time. Grace, because of her own childhood, was a strict disciplinarian. So she spanked uh, her eldest daughter for being naughty. And she once said, I spanked her every day. Albert came along just over 12 months later. As the first male child, he had a date with destiny that he would one day follow in his father's footsteps as ruler of Monaco. But it was a fate young Albert struggled to grasp. When asked what he'd like to be, he, he said he wanted to be a cowboy. He found it very hard to um, sort of engage an ambition for himself since his, his, uh, his role in life was very much laid out before him. As heir, Albert came under the tutelage of his father, Prince Rainier, said to be far stricter than Grace and often absent preoccupied with the business of ruling the Principality. Prince Rainier was extremely wary of other children and of other families getting close to the royal family at Monaco. He didn't really understand why his children needed friends. Caroline's fond of telling a story about how when they were young, they would pretend they were poor, she and Albert, when they played, uh, so they could be like other children. The fact is, once you're in that fishbowl, you're in that fishbowl, and no matter what people do to try to make your life normal, it's not going to be. 
Born seven years after Albert in 1965, Stephanie, the youngest, perhaps experienced a more relaxed childhood than her older siblings. Well, Albert once said that Stephanie learnt very quickly how to wrap, it, wrap her mother around her little finger. I think Stephanie was probably a little bit more spoiled than the others, maybe allowed to get away with a few things. Stephanie was inseparable from her mother. But their close connection meant that, together, they went through one of the most traumatic events to hit the House of Grimaldi. What should have been a simple trip, Grace driving her daughter to the train station, turned into a tragedy that would go down in history. Grace was driving round the infamous hairpin bends of the Corniche outside Monaco when she crashed her car. And so Grace Kelly has died. On the 14th of September 1982, Grace Kelly, Hollywood princess turned real royal, died, aged just 52. Grace Kelly and Stephanie were supposed to be catching a train that would take them to Paris. And they were really excited about the trip. So the little metallic green Rover, very sporty little car, it was full of hat boxes and suitcases. They didn't need a chauffeur because he wouldn't fit. So Grace said that she would drive Stephanie herself. Those roads on the Corniche are, are treacherous. I mean, there's endless winding bends. People always will come up with conspiracy theories. She may have had a small stroke or something like that, but she lost them. Um, control of the car. When she came to, she was disorientated. She jammed her foot on the brakes. Now, there's a bit of doubt around this because it might be that she had accidentally jammed her foot on the accelerator and the car went faster. Stephanie reached for the handbrake, but terrifyingly, the handbrake didn't work. The car was out of control. It slammed through a wall and plunged around a hundred feet off the side of a cliff. It was reported afterwards that neither Grace nor Stephanie were wearing their seat belts. Stephanie was injured in the crash. She had lost a tooth. Her mouth and her tongue and her lips were all cut up. Princess Stephanie has a broken vertebrae, but she's fully conscious, sitting up in bed and eating normally. It was a miracle Stephanie had survived, but the injuries sustained by her mother were devastating. After she was rushed to the Princess Grace Hospital, her health seemed to rapidly deteriorate. She suffered another stroke and uh, that led to a brain hemorrhage and she was actually put on a, um, on a life support machine. Doctors told Prince Rainier and Princess Caroline and Prince Albert uh, that uh, there was no hope for her. So they took the, uh, the terrible decision to uh, turn off the life support machine. Just one day after the accident and with her husband of 26 years by her bedside, one of the biggest and most iconic names in Hollywood history, Princess Grace of Monaco, passed away. Globally, people were very upset. Grace Kelly had been really the, the brightest light of Monte Carlo. When she died, a light went out of Monte Carlo, which has never been relit again. The world was mourning the loss of Grace Kelly, but her three children, were mourning the loss of their mother, and each would cope in different ways and face unique challenges. This was cataclysmic for Princess Caroline. The requirement that from the moment of the death, the moment of the funeral, she herself, Princess Caroline, was essentially the first lady of Monaco. She has had a tricky life with three quite complicated marriages. Inevitably, the death of Princess Grace affected Albert. He sought solace in, uh, in, in all sorts of things. You know, enjoying himself and going out with, with different girls. Prince Albert didn't want to grow up. His behavior was very much of a teenage boy. He'd see a beautiful model, he'd see a beautiful actress, and his attention was with them. The House of Grimaldi was traumatized. But was this down to the loss of grace or something more sinister? Legend tells of an evil curse, one that would jinx the family forever. So it's purported to be Prince Rainier I in the 13th century who kidnapped a beautiful maiden, alas, raped her, and she then 
developed witch-like powers and said that she would put a curse on all future generations born into the Grimaldi family. For the rest of eternity, none of the Grimaldi family would have success or love or happiness in marriage. They've struggled to find lasting life partners. But whether that's a curse or just really bad luck, that's open to debate. The monarchy themselves seem to go by facts and not fiction. Journalist and author Joel Strauty McClure first met Prince Albert in 1988, who told him how the curse is perceived within the House of Grimaldi. He basically said that their family was no different than any other. So he takes it with uh, a grain of salt. And, you know, Prince Rainier, his father, also said that we have the same faults, defects, and attributes as any other human beings. Just because we're royals does not make us immune. Despite rejecting there being any truth in a curse, it has still been an unfortunate shadow hanging over them. None more so than Stephanie, whose life was thrust to the forefront of public attention in the aftermath of the crash. She's talked about to the media about the weight that having that blame put on her has affected her life. And the trauma of her mother's death seemed to send the princess down the path of a royal rebel. She literally went off and joined the circus, she and her kids. Outsiders, stop pointing the finger at you. Albert and Caroline obviously did their very best to support her. And I have to say, I think Rainier was so desolate, so upset that he was, um, of course he was there, but he was not as useful as they were. Speaking to ABC News in America about that traumatic time over 20 years later, it's clear from this television appearance that the accident had deeply affected Stephanie, not only physically, but mentally. In other words, you killed your mother. It's hard enough even, you know, losing your mother and then being blamed for it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible. She's talked about to the media about the weight that having that blame put on her has affected her life. Um, I think it's a terrible thing uh, that she went through. It was just a very freak accident. Stephanie's brush with death and the trauma of the sudden passing of her mother seemed to instill in her a desire to live life for the moment. It set her down the path to being a royal rebel, but it also liberated her in a weird way because she thought, well, you could lose anything in just one minute. So I'm going to take everything I can of life and follow my own whims and desires, which she did, not always for the better. Stephanie Marie Elizabeth Grimaldi was born on the 1st of February 1965. Welcomed into the world with a Monegasque traditional 21-gun salute, she was Grace and Rainier's third and perhaps most colorful child. Third child was spoiled much more than the first and the second, and Stephanie took full advice and full advantage of this. Stephanie was so stubborn and lively, extremely rebellious and very naughty indeed. Even her own mother said, I should have beaten her like a gong 
without making her give way. Grace had a very loving pet name for Stephanie. She called her her enfant terrible, which means terrible child or naughty child. The wide age gap between Stephanie and her siblings, Caroline and Albert, may have strengthened the bond between mother and daughter, but this close relationship would perhaps have consequences in years to come. Prince Rainier was worried about how close Stephanie was to her mother because it's an interdependence as opposed to being preparing you for your future life. We say in French, dans les jupons de sa mère, in the petticoats of her mother. But when her mother died, 17-year-old Stephanie was suddenly left without the guidance and support of her closest ally. Princess Stephanie was quite insecure as a child and hung on to her mother whenever she could and very much uh, needed her to, to help her cope with the world and life. And I think she was just a very lost soul. Stephanie had to face the journey into adulthood without her mother. The princess was keen to get a taste of life outside of the palace. She had the connections, but struggled to find her calling. And she tried modeling, and then she realized the really interesting thing in fashion probably is to be a designer. There's a lot of boring stuff, as we all know about work, and Stephanie wasn't used to boring. She was interning at Christian Dior and allegedly got dismissed. She was dyeing her hair all kinds of wild colors. So I think there was that rebellious nature. Of do you think that because you're the daughter of Princess Grace, you can just behave as you please? With no career choice seeming to stick, Stephanie tried her hand at music. A diversion from the conventional look and path of a princess, Stephanie released her first single in 1986, Urago. What you see there is a very unprincessy image. She's being sexy, she's doing her thing. This is her attempt to say, you know, I'm more than just this princess. I have my own identity and I'm trying this out for size and I like it. Growing up, Stephanie was fascinated by Grace's awe-inspiring Hollywood past. That's perhaps what inspired her to follow in her mother's golden footsteps in her attempt to carve out a creative career. Grace would tell her all the stories about Hollywood and they would sit in the palace and dance together and they'd look at old photographs, they'd talk about the films of the current day. Please welcome Her Serene Highness, Princess Stephanie of Monaco. In 1990, she gave a nervous performance on Aspel and Company, opening up about her true feelings on her bumpy journey to stardom. Trying to establish a name and identity for herself in the shadow of her iconic mother, was always going to be tricky, and comparisons were often drawn. I would love to be an actress one day, but I think it's even harder for me because everybody's like waiting for me and, oh my God, they're going to compare me to my mother, show people that I, I have a personality of my own and I'm not trying to be my mother. Knowing people are watching it saying, you're not as good as the great Hollywood icon that is Grace Kelly. The fear of continually being compared to her mother and coming up short really stymied Stephanie's acting career because it hurt her confidence. But it wasn't just her career that seemingly showed an urge to break free from the royal orbit. As Stephanie continued to live for the moment, her love life took an unexpected turn. Just like generations of Grimaldi's before her, a string of turbulent relationships ensued, with the press linking her to some very high-profile men. She had uh, relationships with Fabien Barthez, the footballer. She had a relationship with Jean-Claude Van Damme, the actor, the Hollywood star, Rob Lowe. And in 1991, she got together with Daniel de Cruet, her bodyguard and a former fishmonger. It marked the start of a very lively love life. Prince Rainier mistrusted him very strongly and he began to suspect that his daughter did not have a very solid sense of what was good for her 
in relationships. He was already involved with uh, another woman who was six months pregnant, but they, uh, they fell in love and Stephanie actually ended up marrying him and they had two children. I mean, I think he was probably the biggest love of her life. Her father was incandescent, but Prince Rainier soon fell for the grandchildren and accepted them and their marriage. But hopes of a fairy tale ending were soon dashed. Less than a year into the marriage, things took a dramatic turn when a series of candid photographs of Daniel were published in Italian magazines. He was actually photographed uh, frolicking, if you, if you will, with uh, Miss Belgium bare breast. Needless to say, Stephanie wasn't terribly happy about that. The couple divorced in 1996, but in 1998, Stephanie's adventures in love continued with another bodyguard, Jean-Raymond Gottlieb. She had a child with him, a daughter called Camille. The father was not named on Camille's birth certificate. And in fact, it was only revealed decades later by the daughter herself on Instagram. She was actually uh, banished by her father to a ski resort to uh, try and recover while the dust settled from the scandal. And then she took up with a Corsican barman. Aged 36, she made another surprising choice and got involved with married Swiss elephant trainer, Franco Cani. Love blossomed after they met at Monaco's International Circus Festival. She literally went off and joined the circus. She and her kids. She's got three kids by now. Princess Caroline was absolutely devastated by her sister's behavior. She felt she was letting the whole family down. He moved into his trailer and they actually travelled around with the circus. And obviously it was, it was not ideal for her, uh, her children. It was very difficult for them to get educated. And I think after a while the, uh, the novelty wore off. The relationship fizzled out, but the circus around her love life wasn't over. Waiting in the wings was Portuguese acrobat, Adans Lopez Perez, who was nearly 10 years her junior. The unlikely couple's family home was a caravan, a far cry from the splendor of the 253-room Prince's Palace of Monaco. That sort of free spirit in her came out, uh, and I think she enjoyed that aspect of it, but it didn't last for long. Uh, eventually, she moved back to the, uh, the luxury of the palace. It may appear to some that her love life was cursed, or that its chaotic nature was perhaps a reaction to her mother's tragic death. But it could be just as Stephanie has said herself. I may be a princess, but above all, I'm a human being. If you step back and look at their lives, which was very, very small, a very tiny bubble of people were allowed to enter into it, you have very little life experience about what people are like, what relationships are like. So I wonder whether this is her way of experimenting. I'm gonna go for all kinds of different people that I find exciting because they're opposite of duty and restraint. I think that's one of the problems that probably Stephanie's had because you've got a palace to move back into. You can live the rest of your life very comfortably having washed out of a marriage. Prince Rainier was reported to be despairing over his daughter, and his displeasure with her behavior may have been communicated in his will. Apparently, he left her only 1%, and he left Caroline and Albert more. Albert, obviously, he's the reigning prince, would have been left the, most of the bulk of the money. I think 1% of the money of uh, the Grimaldi royal family would take care of us all. At the age of 56, Princess Stephanie may not have managed to find happiness in her relationships, but she perhaps gets the love and praise she craves from her three children and her philanthropic work. We've seen the, the young girl going through all those different phases and learning as she goes. And this is natural for somebody who's been through so much to then get to a place where they're emotionally mature, they have their own family, and they can curate the life that they want to lead now. And that seems to be the space that we find Stephanie in. She's not married again, 
and feels content with herself for being a mother and helping others who are in having a difficult life. She's very much involved with her charity work, uh, an AIDS charity and animal charities. I think Grace would be pleased that the wild child has finally grown up and uh, she's finally found happiness and, and seems a lot more serene. Princess Stephanie's colourful life may have raised some eyebrows, but the pressures inside the palace were perhaps felt even more by her eldest sister. Before her mother's death, Caroline sought freedom from royal responsibility. He gave her an escape route. He was her key out of the kingdom. But all of that changed when Grace died. Caroline had to look immaculate, behave immaculately, because her reputation is Monaco's reputation. Princess Caroline was only 25 when her mother died, and her role in the royal family changed overnight. No one could have predicted that she would have to take the reins so young. This was cataclysmic for Princess Caroline. The requirement that from the moment of the death was essentially the first lady of Monaco. Eyes of the world were on her and she couldn't put a foot wrong. She immediately had to learn and reflect all of the royal protocol. She had to look immaculate, behave immaculately, provide no grounds for any possible criticism because her reputation is Monaco's reputation. Caroline was stepping up, something her sister, Stephanie, would never have endured. And her brother, Albert, wasn't ready to take on. Prince Rainey described it as a miracle that after this tragic accident had taken her mother and sad as she was, Caroline just automatically stepped into her mother's shoes. As Rainey said, she had the spirit of her mother. And that spirit was evident in this interview with the American interviewer Barbara Walters. Head held high, she put on a mature performance and revealed how her mother's guidance enabled her to be so resilient. She was such an, an outstanding person. She gave us a strength that when she died, we were able to keep going and, and, um, and we all stuck together and it, it worked. Caroline was extraordinary when her mother died. She had matured almost overnight and she carried out all these duties with, it could be said, a lot of the grace of her mother. She kept Grace's flame alive. As well as supporting her father in his royal duties, Caroline had to support him in his sorrow. Prince Rainier was so distraught when his wife died and uh, literally sometimes was shaking and couldn't uh, handle public engagements. Caroline was beside Rainier at every big event. She was there whenever her mother had been. I don't think he could have coped uh, without Caroline. She was there right by him. And that was absolutely essential to moving the whole institution forward. The birth of their first child was a beacon of light for the Grimaldi family. Born in torrential rain, there were high hopes for Princess Caroline. Princess Caroline was born in the middle of this huge storm. And local superstition has it, that's a very good sign that you are stable and strong. It's a Mediterranean climate and rain is always a good luck sign. And since there was this feeling, there was this curse on the Grimaldos, everybody thought this girl will have real character because the rain has come down during her birth. For Caroline, the pressure was on. There was no space for her to say, hang on, I know this is what I'm supposed to do, but what about what I want? What about my hopes and desires? What if they compete with what's expected of me? Is there any space for me to do that? And the answer was no. There was no space for her to misbehave. Although Caroline had managed to step up to First Lady and handle it so well, 
It was a far cry from the lifestyles she'd become used to in her university days in Paris. For Caroline, Paris was freedom, exploration, finally having lived and left the Monaco Principality, tiny, everybody knows everybody. She really longed to escape, so Paris was her escape. She was finally free of the stiff formality of Monaco and of being a, a, a kind of Euro royal where you're expected to behave all the time. She was able to sow her wild oats and she certainly did. She wanted to get out. She wanted to get away from, if not out of, that fishbowl. But escaping Monaco didn't deliver the freedom Caroline had hoped for. She was photographed by the paparazzi all the time, smoking and drinking and cozying up to her friends who were also equally glamorous and well-appointed. Having a good time as a young, talented, privileged woman is not some sort of crime. But she was painted as a party animal in a negative way. Caroline, in that famous interview with Barbara Walters, gave her side of the story. When I was 18, 19, like every kid my age, I used to go out to a disco on Saturday night, which I don't find it astounding in any way. I went out far less than anybody in my generation, but people think that I lived in nightclubs and parties and that's silly. It's so untrue. She was portrayed by the press and the paparazzi as somehow being unclassy or downscale or loose. These were really slanderous, nasty things to say about her. She found it violating. Her father, Prince Rainier, said, I would shoot these people if I could. She's got her real first taste of freedom. And yet she's got the paps on her tail, looking at her every move, judging her. The headlines are all about this party girl princess. When you see that as a young person, that's going to be incredibly stressful because it's saying, get back in your box, be this perfect princess. She literally became fodder for the photographers for several years and uh, could never go out anywhere uh, without being photographed. Um, you know, and obviously pictures of her smoking and drinking and falling out of bars didn't look very good. And these images of Caroline's lifestyle in Paris didn't play well back home in Monaco. The population in Monaco were absolutely shocked that she was doing things that ordinary people were doing, whereas she should be sitting quietly and obediently in the palace waiting for her prince to come. They wanted her to sew and to learn how to embroider and to wait for an arranged marriage, but she didn't want that. What Caroline did want was to live a normal life. And to her, that meant choosing who she married, a Parisian businessman named Philippe Junot. She saw him, she said later, as her ticket to freedom. Liberté, me voilà, freedom, here I come. Hey, I'm doing what I want to do, this is my life, my choice. Instead of being under the control of my parents in the small principality, guess what? I'm in Paris and I'm living my life. He gave her an escape route. He was obviously her key out of the kingdom. The royal family organized the wedding, which was attended by over 600 guests and celebrities from all over the world. After this lavish public event, Princess Caroline and Philippe Junot escaped to Scotland for their honeymoon and some peace and quiet. The wedding was obviously publicized all over the world. Were you very happy with the way that it, uh, it went eventually? Yes, we were. We really, we enjoyed it and it was really beautiful. But even in the Scottish Highlands, Princess Caroline couldn't escape the cameras. How's married life? Are you enjoying things? Yes, absolutely. Great. And how do you like Scotland? Oh, it's beautiful. First time we're here, so it's, but it's really lovely. Beautiful, what you so up to now it was great. The press intrusion did not let up. Later, Caroline would channel her energies into fighting for her right to privacy. She actually took her action to the European Court of Human Rights to try and get a privacy agreement so that she could be left alone and other members of her family, and that was actually upheld. 
Caroline's parents were not enamored with her choice of husband. Princess Grace had predicted that Caroline's marriage to Philippe Junot would only last two years. Well, what happens is that mothers are often right because they're very inexperienced and Princess Grace was quite convinced that the marriage would not last more than two years and uh, she was spot on. Uh, it, it didn't. When that marriage went south, I think her parents were very relieved. As you know, was seen as the antithesis of what both Grace and Prince Rainier wanted for their daughter. She went into it very young, relatively inexperienced, trying to find a way to get away from her parents, and it had disaster written all over it from the beginning. Princess Grace said it's good that she had a failed first marriage, now she can have a, a successful second one. But Grace would not live to see that success. The second marriage would come in 1983, when a young Italian, Stefano Casiraghi, entered Caroline's life. He too was an aristocrat, very distinguished, very moneyed, very debonair. She has described him as the love of her life. Stefano Casaraghi was a businessman. He had his fingers in several pies. In fact, one of them was a shoe business. And uh, Caroline joked that uh, she was delighted because she loved shoes and he got some specially designed for. She finally found happiness in someone who allowed her the best of both worlds. She could continue her duties in Monaco, but also live the normal family life she had longed for. He understood her role in Monaco. He understood that she needed to shine. She was a famous face they all recognized, a familiar face that they all admired, a woman who had a life that she had to continue with, and he supported her in all that. Caroline might have found the love of her life, but her father was less impressed. Stefano Casaraghi was younger than Princess Caroline, Italian, and had a reputation uh, that did not please her father, but I'm not sure any man would have pleased Prince Rainier. Despite her father's issues, Caroline and Stefano married in December 1983. In contrast to her first marriage to Philippe Junot, which had all the bells and whistles, 600 people attending, this marriage was very low-key, civil wedding with only 20 people. The marriage was a success. Caroline and Stefano were happy. They had three children, Andrea, Charlotte and Pierre. Had Caroline managed to break the Grimaldi curse? I think Caroline settled into motherhood very easily and I think it, in some ways it helped that she had three children very quickly um, because it met, really made her in the eyes of the public uh, a mother figure and uh, I think people were able to see her in a different light. They were probably some of her happiest years. It was, for her, like a dream come true. He was a great companion and a great husband from her point of view. He was quite happy to be in the background, but a great family man, the children all adored him. Caroline was in the midst when she married Stefano Casaraghi of being Monaco's first woman. And that role would not end, of course, until Prince Albert took a wife and, and those obligations were shared, if not dropped. I think that she continued willingly to fulfill her princely obligations to the country and that her third child really felt that uh, she would prefer to stop and be a mother but she fought on she did what she was supposed to do in october 1990 stefano was competing in a powerboat race in monaco a sport at which he excelled usually caroline would be cheering him on but that day, she had an important meeting in Paris. She decided to go to Paris and approach her first husband, Philippe, and ask if he would agree to an annulment. Princess Caroline wanted the annulment because she had found a man she really loved, she had his children, and she wanted to move on. She wanted to draw a line under her past life. She wanted her children to be recognized by the church instead of considered illegitimate. So she petitioned endlessly, tirelessly, the Catholic Church to annul that marriage. 
In the eyes of the Catholic Church, Caroline was still technically married to her first husband. Although they had both gone through civil uh, divorce, they hadn't got a Roman Catholic nullification through. The Roman Catholic Church works very slowly. And she'd hoped that uh, Juno, who by then also had remarried and had a child, would be very keen for this to happen as well. Whilst in Paris, Caroline could never have predicted the events that would follow. Back home in Monaco, there was about to be yet another twist in Caroline's tale. In October 1990, Princess Caroline was in Paris and her husband, Stefano, was competing in a powerboat race in Monaco. During his race, Stefano's boat capsized and he was killed, leaving Caroline widowed with three young children. The irony, of course, in Stefano's death was that this was going to be his last time of boat racing. He decided it wasn't safe and that he was going to give it up and turn to shipbuilding, which would be much safer. It was a very uh, responsible decision if he was father of, of three children, but um, tragically, uh, it was not to be. Caroline's world had fallen apart again. The man she had found who could support her in her royal role was gone. Here she is moving forward with her future. It looks positive, it's hopeful, it's going in the right direction. And suddenly, out of nowhere, her reality is pierced by this terrible, devastating loss. She'd shown massive resilience when her mother died, but I think she went to pieces when her husband died. It brought back memories of her mother as well, and she thought uh, the, the two things triggered each other. And uh, she really did struggle for a couple of years. She was only seen out and about very rarely in public, mainly wearing black and uh, dressing very somberly. There's an interesting shift in family dynamics when Princess Caroline then looks to her father and leans on him and expects him to step up emotionally for her, just as she stepped up to him when her mother died. Stefano's funeral took place at Monaco's Cathedral of St. Nicholas, the same place where Caroline's mother's funeral was held. Princess Caroline's world fell apart. It didn't fall apart in a messy way. It fell apart in a royal way, which is worse because all of that suffering and pain and horror, you can't really express it at all. So it's all happening on the inside. It was really a very sad sight for anybody to witness. I don't think I've ever seen a woman become more dejected, upset, transformed, gaunt than Princess Caroline was in the aftermath. It was just another tragedy to hit the Grimaldi family. On top of everything else, Caroline's marriage still wasn't legitimate in the eyes of the Catholic Church. Not only had she lost Stefano, but her marriage to Stefano wasn't recognized. And I think during a period of dreadful loss, that would have been another layer of grief that this is the love of my life and our union isn't even recognized yet. It would take a decade for the situation to be resolved. Just as Caroline began to get back on her feet again, an old acquaintance, Prince Ernst August of Hanover, came back into her life. Another shot at marriage was on the cards. He is royal as they come. If you look into his family background, it pretty much goes back as far as the Roman Empire. He is super duper, unbelievably mega posh, every which way you look at it. And he has connections to every major European royal family, including the English royal family through King George. On paper, they were a good match. And in 1999, they decided to tie the knot. 
In one sense, he was exactly the right person for her. But in terms of his character, he was bad, bad news. Alas, he doesn't always have terribly royal or regal behavior. Indeed, he has urinated in public. He is allegedly has broken the nose of a cameraman. And woe betide, and what a crime of les majesty. He kissed the queen during a banquet, and that is simply not done. He had a very checkered past, and I think uh, Caroline thought that, you know, uh, marrying somebody who had the right credentials, but obviously knew about his, uh, his colourful private life, and I think she, she thought she could possibly tame him, but in fact um, he carried on as before. It came to a head when Caroline had to attend to her father, who fell seriously ill. Prince Ernst was nowhere to be seen. He actually was in a coma in hospital, brought on by heavy drinking. And at one point he was actually hovering on the brink of life and death, and so it's quite possible that Caroline was going to lose her father uh, and her, her husband in the same week. The one time that she really needed her husband, he himself was ill. Caroline's third marriage had broken down. They went their separate ways because he brought shame and scandal into her life. Meanwhile, Caroline was still saddled with the responsibilities of being First Lady of Monaco. No one could have predicted she would have been in this position for so long. I think Prince Albert felt very pressured, pressured by his older sister, Princess Caroline, who wanted to relinquish the role of First Lady of Monaco. She is just thinking, Prince Albert, will you just get on with it? Will you just settle down, marry, provide an heir, and then I can really get on with my life? In 2005, when their father died, Albert had to step up and take on his father's role. It was a chance of freedom for Caroline. But after all these years, her brother had still not married. Prince Albert didn't want to grow up. His behaviour was very much of a teenage boy. He'd see a beautiful model, he'd see a beautiful actress, and his attention was with them. And his poor sister had to fill in for him a lot of times and be there for him. The credit to Princess Caroline that she was required to maintain face all the time, and she did. She did her duty. Caroline could have been freed from her duties if Albert had found a wife sooner. As early as 1985, when Albert was only 27, he was already being asked the question that would define the public perception of him for many years to come. It was a question Albert grew tired of, etched on his face in this Barbara Walters interview. I have to ask you that question you must be so sick of. <laughs> You know what it is? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Uh, why don't you ask it and answer it? The question is, what about marriage? Okay. <laughs> the answer is... The answer is, I don't know. It was very interesting in Barbara Walters' interview with uh, Prince Albert because he didn't like the question and he dodged it. He didn't actually say, I know I've got a duty to my country. Um, my wonderful sister has given up so much for me. He could do what he liked. He could say what he wanted. As long as his sister was stepping up to be first lady, he didn't have to bother. Was there a reason that Albert wouldn't settle down? Would his playboy lifestyle eventually get the better of him? From the moment he was born, the second of Grace and Rainier's three children, Albert, was destined to become ruler of Monaco. But from an early age, it was clear it was something he wasn't necessarily looking forward to. You can hear from his own mouth somebody who's saying, I just wanted to be a cowboy. I found doing the royal stuff boring. So you've got this real tension between born to rule and I just want to do my own thing. And that, I think, we see play out in his life. 
It was a feeling that spiralled after his mother died, when he was just 23. Albert was delighted that Caroline stood up to take the bulk of the family's royal duties. I always remember Prince Charles once saying that when it finally dawned on him that he was going to become a future king, it came as the most tremendous shock, and it must have been a tremendous shock for Prince Albert as well. And uh, I think that's something which uh, lives with them, and they, they try and forget about it for a while and pretend it's not happening. As long as his sister was stepping up to be First Lady, he didn't have to bother. He also f knew that, that he did have a number of years where he could let his hair down. He didn't have much hair, but he could let his hair down. In particular, Albert compensated for the monotony of royal duties with the kick of adrenaline. He was a marksman, he was a very good swimmer, he actually took up judo, he became a judo black belt, skiing, and uh, he actually took part in the uh, Paris to Dakar rally, although he didn't actually complete it. Uh, and in fact, he's the only royal that I know of who's actually been to the North Pole. So he was quite an action man. Albert may have been inspired by his grandfather's sporting prowess. Grace's father, Jack Kelly, had won three gold medals in rowing across the 1920 and 1924 Olympics. Albert also had Olympic ambitions, but his involved a lot more speed. Prince Albert was interested in bobsledding because he said that it gave him a buzz and it made him feel as if he was alive. Albert established Monaco's first ever bobsleigh team, despite the principality having no snow and no mountains. It's a far cry from the ice tracks of the Alps, but here in Monte Carlo, they just love the World Push Start Championships. It wasn't easy at first, you know, people couldn't even spell the word bobsleigh, let alone uh, know anything about it, so we've, uh, we've come a long way. Albert competed in five Olympics, never coming higher than 25th. I spent a lot of time with Albert the bobsledder, and I felt that he was taking this as seriously as any athlete would take a competition. I was quite impressed. The sense of participating in an international event, especially a winter event, from a Mediterranean country uh, was really quite exciting for them. But when it came to ways of postponing responsibility, Albert's love life, as it was for his sisters, was perhaps even more adventurous than his sports. I can remember doing a story for Cosmopolitan magazine in 1990 titled Prince Albert is Available. At that point, he was considered one of the most eligible bachelors in the world. He was linked with many, many uh, girlfriends, um, Brooke Shields, uh, Naomi Campbell, Claudia Schieffer, and uh, many others. He was having a fairly hedonistic lifestyle and trying to uh, forget that his destiny was eventually to take responsibilities. The prospect of Albert knuckling down and finding a wife to take on Caroline's duties as First Lady seemed remote. In 1987, former Playmate model and German actress B. Fiedler claimed Albert was the father of her child, Daniel. There was a certain amount of controversy about where the DNA for the testing had come, and a judge actually threw that case out, so that wasn't proven. Albert's risky behaviour seemed tailor-made to spice up what he described as boring royal duties. But it was clear his Hollywood mother's life and death also weighed heavily on him. What a fate to have Grace Kelly as a mother. I mean, that beauty, that charm, that vivid intelligence, that charisma. And I think that Albert must have felt both the weight of the expectations on him and the public role that he was absolutely clearly expected to play. I think what he got from his mother was not anything she said, but who she was and the way she carried herself and the way she herself had adapted to becoming Princess of Monaco. He certainly has a sense of calm and lack of drama and acceptance of things that seems to have come more from his mother than from his father. He certainly has a greater sense of equanimity than his sisters do. When you perceive that, you know, your mother was the greatest gift to Monaco and was this beautiful, incredible actress who became, if you like, the perfect princess, 
It must be really difficult to work out your place in that story. Will I ever measure up? Can I ever be as good as her? When Rainier died and Albert finally became ruler in 2005, he was still unmarried and Caroline was still first lady. Just six days before his accession came another bombshell that hinted that Albert wasn't going to settle down anytime soon. Prince Albert officially acknowledged that he was the father of 22-month-old Alexandra, an out-of-wedlock son with former flight attendant Nicole Cost. Well, there have been rumours before about love children and uh, he denied it. Another illegitimate child resurfaced in the week before uh, he was actually going to be enthroned. Uh, and then subsequently the eternity suit actually turned out to be true. Albert was forced to go onto French television and face up in this stiff and uncomfortable interview. J'ai été extrêmement choqué par la façon dont cela a été traité et le, et le, et le moment tout à fait inopportun. Et vous attendez à d'autres révélations ou à d'autres campagnes de cette nature, puisque ça peut donner je sais, envie. Je sais qu'il y en a euh, et qu'il y a d'autres personnes qui euh, font les mêmes, représentent les mêmes, euh, à peu près les mêmes cas. What has baffled me about that is why he was unaware of the existence of condoms. Was he tempting fate? Was he taking a risk? Was he trying to destroy his future? I would like to talk to him about it one day, and I don't imagine I ever will. Albert reportedly provided Nicole with $12,000 a month in financial support, as well as a $2.5 million house in the south of France. Alex would keep the Grimaldi name, but could not succeed Albert. I wonder whether in that position, he had no choice. It seemed like Albert might be about to put his playboy past behind him, but it wasn't long before more revelations surfaced. Prince Albert had already had to admit to the existence of one love child. It turned out that he had yet another love child who was 14 years old. In the early 1990s, Tamara Rotolo, an American, had come forward and claimed that uh, Albert was the father of her daughter Jasmine. Uh, and uh, that was hushed up and he denied it. But in fact, a DNA test uh, eventually proved that he was the father. And in 2006, a year after he'd become the prince, uh, he actually admitted that uh, he was the father of Jasmine as well. So it's like, all right, cards on the table, let's do this because I'm ready and willing to step up. Albert's admissions may have had another purpose. He'd recently started a relationship with a fellow Olympian, a South African swimmer that he'd first met five years earlier. Prince Albert met Charlene Whitstock at a swimming gala uh, and they immediately bonded over a shared uh, love of sport. With what seemed like a clean slate, finally the way seemed clear for Albert to settle down. But Albert's love life was never plain sailing. There were all sorts of rumours that uh, evidence of a third illegitimate child might emerge and that Charlene was getting cold feet. There is speculation that Charlene Whitstock was caught and snatched back trying to flee into the airport so that she wouldn't have to go through with the wedding. By 2010, all three of Grace Kelly's children, now in their 40s and 50s, had spent their entire adult lives cursed by an inability to find a happy marriage. It's the third marriage that Caroline has had and it's come to a bad end, as both of the others have. And now she lives alone. She's back living where she grew up. It's like returning home to the roost. Stephanie has stepped away from the limelight and lives a much more quiet, discreet life. And that is understandable. But there was hope for Albert. In June 2010, Albert was sat on the side of the bed as his girlfriend of five years, Charlene, was packing to leave the apartment. He did it in a very straightforward way. No violins, no beachside romantic setting. He was just in Charlene's flat and he said, would you like to marry me? And she thought he wasn't being serious. He'd actually rang her father before he proposed to Charlene. He chose the timing very badly. He rang Charlene's dad, 
when there was about to be a very big football match in the World Cup South Africa versus France. Her father congratulated him and said, that's great, I now have to get off the phone. There's a football match I want to watch. I don't know at the time if he immediately knew that this is the woman I want. He has told me that he felt sorry for anybody who would become the Princess of Monaco due to the fishbowl effect and the obligations that come with that role. But he obviously waited a long time before he chose someone and was sure after a number of years that she was the one. I think in retrospect, that was his timetable. After years of failed relationships and two confirmed illegitimate children, Albert's engagement to Charlene was announced on June the 23rd, 2010. But marrying a prince isn't an easy thing to do, especially one with a mother like Grace Kelly. I think Albert was worried about the inevitable comparisons uh, to Grace Kelly and he was uh, concerned that Charlene uh, might not be able to cope with this, knowing that you're forever going to be compared to them. Uh, and uh, put on that pedestal, so it was, it was quite a big uh, decision to make. Grace Kelly had struggled with intense loneliness at the start of her royal marriage, struggling to come to terms with being a princess. Albert feared the same would happen to Charlene, risking both her and his happiness. The rumours of him being a playboy, of him being a womaniser, really bedeviled his whole you know, teenager, adulthood, right up to the wedding. And I think it's a brave woman who takes on somebody with that kind of uh, past. On the 2nd of July, 2011, the most glamorous, high-profile event since the 1956 union of Prince Rainier and Grace Kelly took place at the Pink Palace. It was a spectacular affair. There was entertainment by Jean-Michel Jarre and the Eagles, and it was reckoned that the whole thing cost about $65 million. Uh, it was quite an extravaganza. But despite the glorious weather and the smiling congregation, the rumors swirled again, and a happy future looked far from assured. In front of the full glare of the palace cameras, Charlene cried uncontrollably. What did not fail to hit the headlines and get an awful lot of coverage is the fact that she appeared to be crying on her wedding day. The royal couple publicly denied that Charlene was an unwilling bride after tabloids had circulated rumors that Charlene had been spooked by talk of a third confirmed love child for Albert. That wasn't in a cathedral as, uh, as his mother had been. That was actually uh, in a courtyard at the palace as well. It rather feeds into the narrative that Charlene was uh, slightly worried about what was happening. One French paper went as far as to write that she'd attempted to flee back to South Africa, with authorities stopping her helicopter flight to Nice Airport on instructions from the palace. Princess Charlene subsequently branded such rumors as categorical lies. But even the wedding's A-list entertainer, Jean-Michel Jarre, was quizzed on the rumours. I mean, they were, they, they were really in love and, uh, you know, rumours are rumours, as you know, and you are, you, you, you are, you are a specialist of that, so you, you know more than me on that. Charlene and Albert successfully sued the Sunday Times and received an apology for claiming that the wedding wasn't genuine. And they chose this show to provide a forceful denial. So why would we go through all this effort to have this fantastic, you know, couple of days and have our most intimate, dearest friends come and join us for us to be reluctant? Mm -hmm. You know, that was also an, a, a wonderful opportunity for mm -hmm. them to ride on something in a, a negative spin because people would buy. Lots of women are cried at their wedding. So bad for the makeup, but good for the soul. And uh, she was very emotional. And I think that uh, this sort of wedding would have been overwhelming to many people. And I think that she was overwhelmed. After years of procrastination, it finally looked like Albert was the first in his family to find true happiness in marriage. Three years later, on December the 10th, 2014, Albert finally fulfilled his royal duty and provided an heir. At 5.04 p.m. and 5.06 p.m., twins Gabriella Therese Marie and Jacques Honoré Rainier were born. In a life that's had so much tragedy, 
losing your mother, finding that partner, getting married to Charlene Whitstock, and having those twins, and having an heir, Jacques, I think will have been immense relief. All three of Grace Kelly's children struggled with tragedy, troubled love lives, and the challenge of being royal, all amplified by the pain of losing their mother at such a young age. Born into a gilded cage of immense privilege, they were left to navigate their lives without her guiding hand. And perhaps inevitably along the way, made some self-destructive choices. I don't think there's a curse, but certainly the conditions with which the children were brought up uh, and this overpowering figure of Grace Kelly uh, behind them, uh, I think it was inevitable that they were going to find it difficult to live up to expectations. And uh, that might account for some of the, uh, some of the excesses that have gone on. What they have gone through, the deaths, the divorces, the tragedies, are no different than what the rest of us go through, and no easier to bear than what the rest of us go through. And we have watched them suffer and learned that they are, in the end, no different than we are. What Grace Kelly's three children went through wasn't a medieval curse, but was the accrued effect of generations of royal protocol and isolation and emotional coldness, secrecy and lies, being hounded by the press and gossiped about, being followed by the paparazzi. Perhaps if Grace Kelly had lived, there would have been an opportunity to bring a bit more warmth and color and light and intimacy into the royal family.